fire department for open burning regulations. Because 9 out of 10 wildfires can be prevented. Brought to you by Smokey Bear, the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Learn more at SmokeyBear.com. Only you can prevent wildfires. Northern Tool and Equipment. I got a uh, rather serious problem over here. All right, what are we looking at? Cranky mother-in-law asleep on the couch in the man cave. Dear God. It gets worse. That's impossible. She's passed out on the remote. I stand corrected. What do I do? Okay, I want you to grab a Torrin Big Red Hydraulic Bottle Jack. Uh, okay. Now you wedge that bad boy in under your mother-in-law and crank her up skyward. It's working. And got the remote. Great. Now grab that Torrin Big Red Two-Ton Folding Shop Crane and put that woman on wheels. And away we go. There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Welcome back to After Hours AM, The Criminal Code. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis, right along with me. Eric Olson and Dr. Clarissa Cole. And Dr. Cole, uh, why don't you go ahead and give that information again? Because you gave it once at the beginning of the show again, where, where people can call in and get more information about loved ones and also, I suppose, to report that they are safe. So with this fire going on. And again, we're, we're, you're also located darn near in the epicenter of the fire. I mean, you're on the outskirts of this raging wildfire in California as we speak. Yeah, I'm about 20 miles away from the the camp fire, as it's called, and and there's lots and lots of missing people. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that they've actually the the sheriff's office has released a, a list, a running list of missing per, missing persons. So I, I'm encouraging you, if you know people that live, you know, in the area that's affected, go and look at this list, see if you know anyone that is on it, and if you are on it, call them, let them know that you're okay. Um, the, it's, it's the Butte County Sheriff's page. So Butte County is B-U-T-T-E county.net slash sheriff coroner. And if you go there, they have a missing persons list that is active. And if you, and on the flip side, if you want to report someone missing, please go there. Or you can call 530-538-6570 and they will take your report. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for letting everyone know that. All right. Yes. The next the next case that I was going to talk about is, oh, man, he is what you one would term a serial arsonist. OK, so for more than 30 years, a man named Thomas Sweat set hundreds of fires in the Washington, D.C. area. Damn. So 30 yeah. years. And he said that he he said in his estimation, he set well over 300 fires. Wow. So he's a true fire bug. Yes. The classic. And the classic sort of fire bug. Yeah, and he, and he had a, like a homemade device that he used. He he filled, apparently he filled a milk jug with gasoline with a fabric plugged opening that mm. he used as a wick. And so the fire would burn up this fabric wick, consume the container for about 20 minutes before the fumes and gasoline. 20 really set minutes, off. huh? Yeah. He, he had a special wow. way of doing it, I guess, that I don't want to share with anyone that it would allow it to sort of smolder for 20 minutes and allow him to get away if he wanted to or to just sit and watch and typically he was not going for casualties so he was setting these in in places where he did not expect people to be but Mm -hmm. some people did die and uh his targets were usually this is the weirdest part usually men that he found attractive oh so if they were cute in his estimation he wanted to kill them wow well no, because then he would have set their houses on fire, and that's not what he ah. did. He would follow them home, and instead of, like, approaching them and just talking to them like, you know, a normal person, he would put an incendiary device in their car, in the driveway, and that then, sort of thing. And then show up and be the hero. Oh, my God, it's on fire! <laughs> no, he would just watch from a safe distance, and he did this many times, many times. And there is one time where it resulted in multiple fatalities, unfortunately. The man went home. He had a wife and kids who lived upstairs. He set the incendiary device on this man's doorstep, which was on the lower level. But the house, the doorframe in particular, caught fire 
very quickly. And since the family was asleep as the house started to go up, I guess the, the man's wife died from, from smoke inhalation. Oh. And two other elderly women also uh, died because something caught fire near there and they couldn't get out. So they finally did catch him. And yeah, he's implicated in over 300 fires. Wow. That, that is, is why? That, yeah. Is there a why? Yes. So again, there's the six type uh, six types of arsonists, right? And now Thomas Sweat would absolutely qualify as the pyromaniac type, right? These are pathological fire setters. So while he did have a reason as far as setting some of the fires when it came to, you know, an attractive man, that sort of a thing, he didn't always. He didn't always have a reason at all. He just found the act itself to be... Uh, a sexual release, if you will, which is fire. why he's, yeah. which is why he stayed to watch a lot of the fires. It was so he could masturbate at the same time. Oh, well, that's, wow. That's, yes, it's it's a sexual. Thing. It's better, better, better still. Now, yeah, that's an image I can't. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Erase <laughs> from my mind. <laughs> oh, sorry. Wow. man. So he would light fires and play with himself. Yes, and he would stick around for that reason. He liked to see people fighting the fires. He liked to see the chaos. The, the ensuing chaos also kind of turns them on, a pyromaniac. Um, a lot of times they are there watching or videotaping in some instances. Um, we've seen that before. There, there's another type, um, the, the vandal type. Mm -hmm. uh, and that type is often a teenager, and they often videotape as well yeah um yeah. they're they're unlike other types of arsonists they are they, they work in pairs yeah, yeah they're thrill the thrill sort of the vandalism the crimes are committed sort of out of a belly a rebellion sort of an attempt to destroy stuff i mean there's there's sort of like the practical types the crime concealment type or the insurance claim type you know yeah where it's for where it's for a financial motive or for a crime motive so you know this struck me as weird though the crime concealment thing so I'm thinking, because my brain is twisted, right? If I'm going to set a fire, it's going to be to conceal, like, a murder or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some, something big. Oh, no. The most popular reason to set a fire is to conceal a burglary. What? I know. That, that makes no sense. Uh, that, that, that Talk makes... about adding insult to injury. Yeah. I'm yeah. so confused by that whole thing. Like, I totally thought it was going to be to get away with murder. And yes, that has happened in, in multiple cases, right? If you research that, you'll see mm -hmm. that. But I assumed that's why they'd be well, setting the fires. Oh, no. It's because they stole something. And fire does not get rid of all evidence. No, it doesn't. Not it, even close. No, Are you kidding me? No, they can still get fingerprints off things that have been burned, too. They can get DNA. Yep. They can get, oh, man. It doesn't. And plus, like, if you are thinking of starting a fire to cover a murder, first of all, don't. There's just no way. I'm sorry. And it, it won't cover it. It just won't. No. Like, and, unless there's smoke inhalation in the lungs of the victim and that's the only thing wrong with them. The person would have to be not. almost, they would have to be just cremated. Like, nothing but ashes left of the victim, right? Which mm. doesn't happen. And no. people don't understand that. No. Like, in a typical house fire, that's not enough. That, that no. is not going to cremate a person. When I was a kid, when I was in high school, I almost took up the profession of being a, a, a well, an embalmer, a mortuary guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of them. What, what's the proper name? It's, I'm, it's escaping me. Yeah, medical moment. examiner. Or yeah, coroner. yeah. And and and, and I, I knew the guy in my local town. His name was Keith. Really nice guy. And he said, you know, if you're really seriously thinking about this, why don't you come in for an autopsy? Hey, and there you why, go. why don't you come in for an embalming? I'll get mm -hmm. the family's consent because, you know, we still got to make sure that you can witness this because it is a procedure and they're a family member. You should come on down and really see what you're going to get yourself into. Make sure it's what you want to do. And, and I couldn't sit through it, but we were talking about cremation. And he's like 21, 2300 degrees. These things are oh, run yeah. at. I mean, yeah. it's just unreal. And for a long period of time. Yeah. A long period of time. A couple too, hours. Like, yeah. It's a, and they have to turn the body multiple yeah, times. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a quick thing. It, it it takes a very long time to cremate a body. At extremely high temperatures, mm. the body typically has to be turned. Now, people don't understand. They think like a fire is going to do it. And I'm like, no, not even close. There's no. so much physical evidence no. left. The, yeah. That's the problem kind of with the campfire, though, right now, is that that fire, because of the, the sheer you know magnitude of the fire, yeah. that one is probably hot enough. 
and burned long enough that it probably did destroy a lot of of remains. How many um, crimes do you think, though, in the backdrop of this fire could potentially be committed and, and no one ever find out because of the fire? Yeah, you, you know I mean, oh gosh, quite a, quite you a know, few. I mean, perfect yeah, opportunity. If, if it's a fire like this, yeah, if you had time, commit all the crimes you can because it'll be concealed. No, I mean, you never know what's going to burn and what isn't, though. I yeah. mean, that that's the thing that is so interesting to me. I mean, there there was a story today in in a, a local paper here about a man and a wife who went back to the house to see if they could salvage anything, right? Mm-hmm. And if you've seen any of the pictures, it's decimated. Yeah, Everything is luck. gone. And they shared pictures of their home, right? Their home was rubble nothing but rubble and some granite countertops that they recently had installed and the man went back there looking for his wife's wedding ring because she'd set it on the counter before washing dishes oh he found it oh wow it survived because it was on that granite maybe it's like how i mean that's that's just it you know like there were shops where the almost the entire shop was burned and then like a sign here or there is fine. It's like yeah, it's who just knows? Weird. Like it's, it's chance. Yeah, a fire behaves very strangely. So if you're going to try to cover something with fire, I would say just like don't because yeah. <laughs> yeah. you don't know. You don't know what it's going to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That one yeah. clue. You know but, what I mean? You leave a handprint and, on the French door. That glass will be and, there. You and, know what I mean? But when I was talking to this funeral funeral home director, why take so long to cremate someone? He says, "Remember, you're mostly water. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you, it's actually very hard." To, I mean, he says, of course, you know, he went in graphic detail about body fat and that burning burst. I was, just gonna say and, the, you, I was you know actually going to bring up the fat. I was like, the fat in the oils is another. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it was, it was actually kind of intriguing, but disgusting all at the same time. So. Uh, I have a strange sort of morgue-related uh, tale very quickly. Well, I love morgue-related tales. I'm a sucker for a good morgue. <laughs> Uh, I, I lived in a house when I worked at Napa State Hospital. They uh, often at prisons, and just so if people don't know, in California and m- in multiple places across the United States, in state hospitals or prisons, there are often houses that were built on the grounds of those places. Mm-hmm. Um, at, you know, because way back when people would live there, it's kind of akin to an army base, if you will. Sure. There's housing. And so at Napa State Hospital, I lived in a house at, at Napa. Uh, just for a little while, about six months, I lived in a state provided home. Um, and uh, there was, you know, where you do laundry, it was like in a, in a basement sort of area. And I went down there and my roommate, I I was living with a roommate at the time, a social worker, and she went down there and she had all of her clothes all folded up. And she was like, yeah, have you, have you done laundry yet? And I said, no. And she's like, oh my gosh, aren't these tables amazing? There's all this space (laughs) and they're so nice. They're stainless steel. I'm like, "Mm mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just keep doing the lot. Yeah, I was like, the huh? You know, she's like, what? Why did you say it like that? I'm like, nothing, nothing. They're fine. And she's like, and look at these edges. Like, you, you like to, to like, what is this to like catch lint or something? And I'm and I'm like, okay, so don't freak out when I tell you this. She's like, what? I'm like, that would be a draining table. Yeah, I was gonna say, did the drain in the middle of it not, you know, towards the end, not give it away? That it, it was... she did not see that, and she literally thought it had something to do with wet laundry. She had no idea. <laughs> Uh, I think she rewashed her clothes. Oh, uh, you uh, know, that was know, probably right? used like, a long like time ago. Or anything. Yeah. And, and come to find out. So like, I, you know, I knew what it was. She didn't. I told her and she's like, no, that can't be right. Went to the hospital administration the next day and said, I just want to make sure that I'm right about this. And they said, oh, yeah, during World War Two. Yeah. This, this yeah. was used for Navy, uh, for the Navy when people were injured sure. and your particular house was a makeshift morgue at that time. There you go. There, there you yeah. go. Nothing to be afraid of. It was World oh, so War II at the time. The sanctuary par- parlor was where our dining room was, and the the where they processed the bodies was in the uh, basement where we did our laundry. Nothing yeah. could possibly be wrong with that scenario. <laughs> it was totally fine. I didn't think anything was wrong with it. Of course, nobody wanted to come over for dinner parties, but okay. That's on you. <laughs> oh, but for Halloween. Oh, my goodness. That would have been. I got lo- really quickly, though. I got a story like that. I, I knew people that were eating off one of those tables. Oh, no. And, 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 I, and I told them because they said, wow, this is a really big, nice, sturdy table. Nice. They were using yeah. it for tools. Uh, a, a place I used to, a mechanic shop, I, he got a really good killer deal on these old embalming tables and they work really great for tools and stuff because it's steel 
Yeah, I mean, you can oh, set stuff on it. Beautiful. And nice bit. Well, these guys, you know, those are clean ones. So they're over there eating chow. And I said, oh, you enjoy eating up embalming tables.